Okay. <clears throat> Sunday we read through verses 1 through 7 of the introduction in chapter 1. And basically we talked about how this chapter, and especially this part of the chapter, makes a connection with uh, the book of Genesis, and especially the end part of the book of Genesis. And um, there's a reason for that. There are several reasons for that. And one of the reasons is because uh, Moses, as the author, wrote both books, uh, as he was directed by the Holy Spirit, and that uh, this just makes a natural lead-in and a bridge between Genesis and Exodus. So it identifies who went down into Egypt uh, that were the Israelites, uh, gives the family background. The genealogies, as we talked about Sunday, are very important in the Bible. Um, when those are listed, it's not simply just saying, well, here's the family or here are the prominent people uh, or the prominent tribes even back then, but there's also people that are connected in there that are very important uh, to the story of God progressing with his providence through these people. And so he names the 12 tribes and uh, in effect. And then uh, it says in verse 6, Joseph died and the land was filled with them. And we talked about how they just have multiplied. And it's amazing in, in one respect, you have this promise from God to the uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and yet Abraham had one son that the lineage passed through, and uh, Isaac had a couple, and then all of a sudden Jacob comes on the scene, and we've got 12. Well, you can start to understand then how this multiplication of people how they're going to become a mighty nation. And that's another thing we can see through these um, genealogies that are put in here. Okay, so we're going to start in verse 8 with that. And we're in chapters 1 and 2. We'll be finish up chapter 2 tonight. And 8 through 14, the first section. And the first verse there... Uh, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And you can take that any number of ways. You can take it to mean that physically he didn't know him. That'd be the simplest way. Uh, per, certainly that's not what it's talking about because we're talking about a gap of about 480 years, going, or 423 or what, at least 400 years that's going on here. And so probably that's not it. And when he says a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, what do you think that has reference to? I know we're down in, in numbers tonight a little bit. I can't see where. Oh, okay. Yes. Go ahead again. That's right. And, and we're going to see it unfold in the next few verses here. That, um, and, and we talked about this, probably this is when the Hyksos uh, uh, realm or kingdom, who was over Egypt at the time of uh, Joseph and being a Semitic people and being more favorable, uh, they were the shepherd kings. And so being more favorable um, to the Hebrews or to the Israelites, then Joseph, of course, after the dreams and the uh, administration during the uh, 
plentiful years and then during the lean years, became very famous in Egypt. He was the number two guy, second to Pharaoh. And now we read, we read about another generation and we know historically what happened in Egypt was the Hyksos were driven out by the Egyptians. The uh, Hyksos, when they set up the kingdom, were more around the delta of the Nile River and they left on the southern portion of the kingdom, they left the Egyptians still ruling and the Egyptian royalty was still ruling, but they were paying tribute to the Hyksos kings. And finally, they uh, had a revolution. They rebelled, a rebellion, and they drove out the Hyksos, and then the Egyptians themselves took over again the kingdom. So that's what we're talking about here, is they took over that kingdom. And so now you have a king that not that he didn't know Joseph actually or even know about him, but he didn't care for him. He wouldn't have cared for that relationship that Joseph and his family would have shared with the Egyptian rulers at that time. And so now the circumstance has changed dramatically for the people of God. The circumstance has changed dramatically. And so a new king comes in, doesn't know Joseph, doesn't care about uh, Joseph and his family at this time. Uh, certainly, you would think the stories would have been heard. Everyone in the Egyptian kingdom would have known about that. But now at this time, somebody else comes in. And... Uh, you know, that could happen to any of them. That could happen in our country, as a matter of fact. I'm not trying to get political here. I'm just saying, with, for a lack of, lack of a better term, with regime change, uh, this type of thing could happen, where we could get a ruler, if you will, who knows not Christians, who knows not the way, and doesn't care about it and therefore tries to stamp it out, just as this new Pharaoh did. So that's where we sit. There's a new political situation. Um, there's a new sheriff in town. Somebody else is, and they're totally opposite of what was in there before. So why, um, why does this new Pharaoh What is his objection to these people? First of all, they're not the same as as he is. They're not even similar in that regard as maybe the Hyksos would have been, being a Semitic people. D? And, and I don't have a map here, I should have put one up, but the, the, um, the land of Canaan, which is immediately adjacent to Egypt, the land of Canaan has about three major highways, if you will, that go through it from north to south. And uh, conquering kings later and earlier, have used those highways. Again, I wish I had the map up so I could show you. Uh, in, in order to uh, go to war or to subjugate Egypt later, that type of thing. And so here they are in the land of Goshen, which is the eastern side of the delta of the Nile River. Visualize that. And... The, the people, invaders that be coming in, would be coming in right where they are. And the danger is 
they're going to side with people that are coming in to conquer us. And as a result, we're going to face insurrection from within in addition to fighting an enemy without. And that's the worst possible strategic position for a ruler to be in. And so let's just eliminate the problem within. We can control that. Uh, but uh, in order to strengthen us, against anybody potentially coming in. So he's going to be proactive on this, and he's going to take care of what he perceives as a potential threat to the Egyptians as a result of having the Hebrews or the Israelites within his kingdom. So let's read about that. Uh, let's read verses 9 and 10 on that. Corbin, would you read that? We're in Exodus chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Okay, so that's the whole reason right there. And he thinks he's being shrewd. By doing that, meaning let's be wise, let's, let's not only be wise, but let's figure out what things bad could happen and let's, let's uh, uh, get our people oriented toward staving off this potential threat in the future. Yes? There's some benefit, There's some benefit they're deriving. The, the, uh, I think that's a possibility. Another possibility is that this wording is an, ex it's an idiom that it doesn't exactly say what it means. How's that? I mean, how would we know that, you know, unless you're a Hebrew scholar? And uh, <clears throat> even then, you probably know less than we know. But anyway, um, it could mean that they take possession of the land. Uh, that, that they take possession rather than uh, being escaping from the land, that in effect they're taking possession of the land. I don't know, I like your explanation better. It's, it's uh, interesting because uh, they want them to be their slaves, but they don't want the potential of them warring against them. Steve. That's right. And, and, uh, <clears throat> A lot of stuff they're doing, their own people don't want to do. And so this is a captive labor force that they have, which um, uh, they can accomplish much. I mean, you, you, you look at the building of the pyramids, you look at especially, which is one of the major events of construction in, in ancient history, and 
Uh, even today, <clears throat> experts will look at that and say, how, you know, it had to be aliens. They had to have these spaceships that were moving these huge stones for them here. There's no way they could have done it. Well, that's not true, uh, the alien part. But uh, probably uh, the people back then um, were smarter in terms of using uh, pulleys and leverage and figuring out machines that they could use in order to move these huge stones. And you say, well, how did they get them up there? I'm glad you asked. I just happened to be at the Acropolis last May, and there were drawings of how they got the big stones, which the Acropolis set up on this hill, and it's, it's a pretty steep walk if you were to use a walkway. But it showed them using pulleys and levers in order to haul these rocks up and get them up to the top and then put them in the shape of the Parthenon or a temple or whatever, that type of thing. So I'm sure the same thing could have happened here. Just because we haven't totally figured it out doesn't mean that it couldn't have been done. <clears throat> And surely there, there is some way to get that done. Yeah, Steve? What's that? They did it. That's right. One thing we do know for sure, they did it. And again, I'm assuming, I'm presuming there were no aliens around helping with uh, spaceships. Okay. So at any rate, this Pharaoh has determined this is not a good situation and I'm going to deal with it. We're going to take care of it. And this is how he purports to take care of it. Uh, let's, read, <clears throat> let's read verses 11 through 14. Uh, somebody volunteers, so I don't have to call on Corbin again. Yeah, Alex. Okay, <clears throat> in the ESV, it ends up made them work as slaves in there. So this is uh, how they set out to address that. They build these two, uh, what they call store cities, which apparently are cities that are made in order to have storehouses of grain, food, and weapons for soldiers in case there is an invasion on that side from the north along the way of the sea there, the Mediterranean Sea. <clears throat> and so they build these cities, as Steve pointed out, cheap labor, um, doing that. And, but the more they're oppressed, the more they're multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. The Hebrew wording there for that particular passage in verse 12 is literally as for the Israelites they grew they were fruitful they swarmed they increased they got powerful more and more and the land was filled with them it just shows the emphasis that the writer is putting on this explosion of the population in uh, uh, Egypt at that time of the Israelites. So here they are, they set out to get that number controlled and contained, and instead they're just blossoming all over the place. That's the problem. So they became more ruthless. The harder, the more they increased the population, the harder they were on them. <clears throat> yes? Joe. Set themselves to rule 
That's right. How, uh, and I was going to use that as an example. That's, that's okay. After uh, Stephen uh, gave his speech, and um, upon his death, <clears throat> the uh, rulers at that time thought we're going to control them all. You know, so somebody like a Paul or a Saul at that time goes out and just wreaks havoc on the Christians at that time. And rather than eliminating them as a force uh, instead of them just being clustered around Jerusalem they spread throughout the whole world so in effect it serves God's purpose of doing that and of, of spreading the world the word uh, throughout the world in a similar fashion here as you said 400 years they have been uh, in Egypt and I assume, uh, at this point, I don't assume, they didn't have the law, and so there's no formal worship as such going on as directed by the law. And, you know, I wonder how many of them really thought, well, God will deliver us someday. I don't know. I don't know if that was in the forefront of their mind. But you know what, even, even if it, we're going to find out they prayed, and of course they asked God for relief, but um, not sure how many of them would have had that strong faith at that point. I mean, 400 years is a long time. That's like the period between the Testaments. And people uh, of God, sometimes we get anxious because things aren't happening on our time frame. Because things aren't getting done. I want to see it now. Well, there's some promises none of us maybe will see. But the promises are still there for us. The prophecies are still there. God's word is still in effect. And, and he is ruling. But it's in his time. We go back to that song. In his time. So it's when he's ready, it will happen. And if you think about it here, they've been more and more oppressed. They've been here 400 plus years. And who knows if they're thinking it may be another 400 years if something does happen. Or if it was going to happen, why hadn't it happened already? Uh, a lot of us would be very anxious probably, uh, if we looked at it from that standpoint. But again, when God does decide to move, and again, if you look at the number of the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then boom, and then 400 years in Egypt, boom, boom, a lot of people. And that's how he's going to accomplish his will. And now things are going to start to pick up because... God's getting ready to move. Okay. So, they built those two cities, uh, which is quite a feat, building cities back then. That, that was a big deal. The more they oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. They were doing brick and mortar and all kind of work in the fields that were not necessarily the work they were used to as they were uh, uh, sojourning in the land of Canaan. And so, uh, here they are, and this creates a tension between the Israelites and the new Pharaoh, and it just keeps building. The story, the tension in the story keeps building. And something's got to give, as the old saying is. Something's got to give. So let's see what happens. First of all, I'm going to go over to the next section here, chapters 15 through 22, and let's read, um, let's go ahead and read all of those, 15 through 22, 
which finish up chapter one. Somebody raise your hands. Yeah, go ahead, Jared. Okay, so verse 17, the midwives feared God and probably means they feared not obeying God, that they had a respect, they had a moral uh, ethic to them, they wanted to do what was right, they were, for lack of a better term, religious, and therefore they did fear God and didn't do as the king commanded them. Now, the, the king told them, if it's a son, while you're there, um, kill the son. <clears throat> and a couple of things. First of all, their names are mentioned here. Sh- Shifra and Pua. Not a very attractive name today, but uh, and I shouldn't say that. There may be a Pua in our midst here. I'm not sure visiting or something, and so I'm sorry. I apologize. But do you think two midwives could have handled the load of all of those uh, Egyptian, I mean, all the Israelites just giving birth? I don't think so. Because in verse 19, it talks about the other midwives. And so probably these were the two heads if you will. They were the ones that coordinated the other midwives. And typically in that time, from what I can read, midwives probably had not had children uh, because they're in a position to help other women have children. And so probably at that time, according to the historians, probably these women did not have children. Okay, so verse 17, the midwives feared God, did not do as the king of Egypt, commanded them, and they let the male children live. And then the king of Egypt, now, it's in the next verse, 17 and 18, but there's a lot of time that's passing through here, I think. There's got to be enough time for Pharaoh to see what I commanded is not happening out there. We've just got more and more. So we're talking about at least nine months and probably two or three years, maybe, have passed, several years may have passed before Pharaoh figures out, hmm, not, not so good. I don't know what's going on here. And so he brings in the midwives. Why have you done this and let the male children live? And their answer is, well, it's because... The Israelites, their women, our women in effect, because it's, it's them, um, are a lot more lively. And by that they mean that, in effect, my terms, not the Bible terms, in effect when labor comes on, it happens fast. They have a quick birth. And it, not enough time stretches out for the midwives to get there. I think that's what they're telling Pharaoh here. And as a result of that, you know, we just can't get there fast enough. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied, verse 20, and they grew very strong. So that means it's okay to lie to Pharaoh as long as you fear God. 
God dwelt well with them. There's a lot of hands going up. Uh, okay, Corbin. So do you think before Pharaoh's command that uh, the midwives still had the same issue? They couldn't get there fast enough? <laughs> okay. That's, okay. That's fair enough. Uh, Dee, were you going to answer? Okay, and, and certainly it's not okay to lie, uh, but they did fear God. Yes, Marie. That's right. And so I think that's probably the difference. Why was there given that contract to the adult life? Even though they did lie, God told them they made the right Right. And because God blessed them, if you will, uh, through this passage, that would indicate to me that God has not asked them to do something that would be in violation of his law also in terms of lying. Steve? Good points. And uh, we're going to move on. Yeah, Leanne. I was just going to say, in, in the text, um, excuse me, verse 17, it does say the same chose not to receive the faith, saved the faith, 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 the this rate, I'm not going very well. Um, so, chapter 2, I'm going to move on. Uh, verses 1 through, let's see, let's get through this. There. <clears throat> Back up. Okay, so, in chapter 2, 1 through 10, we read about uh, now man from the house of Levi. We go from a, a global perspective, if you will, of the whole of the children of Israel, and now we're coming down to a man and a wife. And specifically, we're told that they're Levi, they're Levites. That's very important for what's coming. They're establishing that fact right now. God is establishing that through the Word. And uh, what was... What were the names of his parents? Moses. Amran and Jochebed. I heard that several different places. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> we know the story. It's a famous story. Uh, I meant to point out verse 22, where the last verse where Pharaoh says, 
in effect, I'm not going through the, the uh, midwives anymore. I'm going directly to the people. And the people obviously were intermixed with the children of Israel because he tells his people, every son's born, you cast him into the Nile. I'm eliminating the middleman here. I'm going straight to the, to the source, <clears throat> and we're going to eliminate it there. And so uh, this is even worse in terms of a judgment on them. And this one little boy is born, and we're all very familiar with the story. And it takes three women to save the boy from death. <clears throat> it takes Miriam first. Uh, they put uh, baby Moses into the ark, the basket. Uh, they put bitumen and pitch on the inside to make it waterproof, put it out in the bulrushes so it would be hidden, and try to save him that way. And coincidentally, that happens to be at a time when Pharaoh's daughter is going down uh, to dip into the Nile. And uh, the, the Nile was a god itself, as far as they were concerned. And uh, she goes down there, she sees the baby. Miriam comes back and says, would you like someone uh, to uh, look after the baby? And uh, she knows it's Hebrew. She knows the baby is Hebrew. And she says, yes, of course. Miriam gets her mother, the mother of the baby, <clears throat> brings her to Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter hires her, uh, in effect, to be the wet nurse for this baby and to raise it up. And everything's going well. And if God's hand is not involved in all that, you know, I don't know what is. Because every little step of the way, something has to happen that is in a positive way in order for Moses to survive. And the shrewdness is really on the part of Jochebed and Miriam. They're the ones that are shrewd and figure out how to handle this situation. And with the complicity of Pharaoh's daughter. And so... If you want to look ahead to Hebrews 11:23, I'm not going to read that now, but it says, "By faith, Moses' parents hid Moses." OK. Um, you can read through the rest of the chapter. I'm going to have to stop there. I don't think I can talk quite that fast, but um, and I see the kids all out in the hall there. But uh, 40 years is going to pass in the twinkling of an eye. These 40-year per periods for Moses. And uh, again, we know the story. And if uh, the teacher on Sunday morning wants to briefly talk on that, that's fine. If not, read it and get away and be ready for chapter 3 and 4 on Sunday. Appreciate your good remarks <clears throat> for class today. And we'll start there on Sunday morning.